Secret Engineer, How Emily Roebling Built the Brooklyn Bridge, written by Rachel Darty. Emily Warren was a bright, shiny spark who loved to learn. Like many girls, she studied sewing and piano. Unlike many girls, she also studied math and science. In time, she married a, young, a spry young engineer named Washington Roebling, whose mind was just as hungry as hers. The Roebling family built bridges. Washington's father, John A. Roebling, was considered one of the greatest engineers of his time, and now he had a risky new idea. He told Washington and Emily he had designed a bridge to span the quick, whirling waters of the East River and to finally link Manhattan and Brooklyn. He planned to build two colossal towers and sling a 14,000-foot web of steel cable between them to create the grandest avenue the world had ever seen. John wanted to send his son to Europe to learn about the new technology for building bridges. Emily insisted she would accompany him. In Europe, Emily and Washington explored historic towns, tasted new foods, and studied the new recent advance in bridge building, the caisson. A caisson is like a giant open box turned upside down and sunk into the water. The opening at the bottom traps air as the box sinks so it's dry inside. This allows workers to dig deep into the riverbed to find solid rock to build upon. These caissons, once fixed to the firm bedrock, form a sturdy base for the bridge towers, strong enough to support the structure's weight. Emily and Washington hurried back to New York, buzzing with the discovery. You can see here from the diagram, the explanation. John wove two caissons into his design and prepared to build the Great Bridge, but he died before construction began in 1870. Washington would have to take over as chief engineer. The caissons were larger than any had ever been made. The base of each one measured about 17,000 square feet. Just building them seemed nearly impossible, and that was only the beginning. Washington soon discovered that construction inside the caissons was muddy, dark, and sweltering. After hours in the caisson every day, he returned home aching and dizzy, but he pressed on. Washington drew plans late into the night with Emily by his side. Emily heard that some of the workers were falling ill with pain, weakness, and nausea. They called it caisson sickness. Then, in 1872, Washington, like many of his workers, collapsed on the dock, and he had to be ferried back home to Brooklyn. Weeks later, Washington still couldn't get out of bed. Emily insisted she'd be his eyes and ears, and legs, and arms. As Washington's eyesight dimmed from the case and sickness, he dictated instructional letters to Emily, and she read construction reports to him. Washington could breathe a little easier knowing Emily would be at the work site. But Washington's words felt clunky and confusing when Emily repeated them to the engineers. She faithfully copied the terms and equations, but they seemed like a foreign language. She was nervous. Construction on the bridge was only just beginning, and there was so much she didn't know. So, Emily started to read. She studied bridge engineering and learned from Washington and the assistant engineers. As she studied, the mechanics of the bridge became clearer. The main parts of the bridge, the towers, the cables, and the deck, and the anchorage blocks. One set of cables would be strung between the tops of the towers. They would balance the pull of the other cables that would lead from the towers to the anchorage blocks at either end of the bridge. The cables create the tension force and the towers create the compression force. A force is an invisible push or pull that acts on an object 
and together these opposite forces would hold the deck upright. The more Emily learned, the more confident she felt. As time went on, she could see the drawings coming to life. She saw the steel cable swooping between towers in what she'd learned was called catenary curve. The perfect natural arc of a cable held only at its ends, like a clothesline or a jump rope. She saw the tiny ink scratches she squinted at on paper transform into huge vertical cables called suspenders, which would shift the weight of the bridge deck to the main cables. She grinned, knowing that each suspender could hold 70 tons. Emily learned that, Robling, that the Robling design for the bridge required a new method of steelworking that had never been used before. The cables were spun from thousands of thin steel wires twisted together like invisible yarn. The rigid deck platform was steadied with steel stays, cables that stripped down diagonally from the towers like sunbeams. With the tower and the deck, each diagonal line formed a triangle the very longest shape. No steel mill had ever been asked to make steel cables like these before, and the manufacturers wanted to meet with Washington to make sure they understood the plans. But Washington fretted. If word got out how sick he was and that a woman was in charge, the project would surely be taken away from the Roeblings, despite all their work. Emily understood his concerns, but she insisted she could handle it. And when the meeting came, she answered all their questions perfectly. More than 10 years had passed since Emily had taken the reins and the bridge was nearly built. She saw the main cable stretching across the wide river. From her window, they looked as delicate as spider silk but she thought proudly of the equations she had studied to calculate the cable's strength. But just before the bridge was set to open, the public, who had never seen a bridge this large, began to worry. The skinny wires look too weak, they said. The river is too wide, they said. Everyone will fall into the water and drown. Emily insisted they were wrong. She trusted the thickness and strength of the steel cables, the stability of the diagonal stays, and the balance of the anchorage blocks against the towers. She knew the equations by heart. A week before the grand opening, Emily rode in a, an open carriage on the first trip across the finished bridge. She carried a rooster in her lap as a symbol of victory. When the Brooklyn Bridge opened in May 24, 1883, the two cities set off rockets and fireworks. Bands played from steamboats below all night long. Crowds gathered on both riverbanks and on boats in between to celebrate, to celebrate the great feat of engineering, never even knowing about the contributions of an insistent woman named Emily Roebling. And if you want to know more about Emily, you can look at this book I'll have available in the STEM room. You're welcome to check it out and look at it anytime you want. Here are some actual pictures of the Brooklyn Bridge today and the diagrams. The end.